My name is Terry Shepard, and I will be your guide into the world of close quarter battle. I'm a current U.S. Army Green Beret, and I have fought in two armed conflicts in the Middle East. Initially, I was trained to fight in the European theater to protect the U.S. and its Western allies from the Soviet Union during the heart of the Cold War. As a Green Beret, I had to learn an Eastern Bloc language and be prepared to infiltrate behind enemy lines to link up with, train, and fight alongside partisans to defeat the Red Army in their very own backyard. In other words, I had to be really good at guerrilla warfare. Although the Cold War is technically over, we now face a new global conflict, terrorism. To combat this threat, I've got to be an expert in the techniques of close quarter battle. Together, we'll explore how elite soldiers and police units use these specific techniques, weapons and technologies to defeat their enemies at very close range. The term close quarter battle is used to describe scenarios that police and military face in both urban and rural environments. Although the origin of close quarter battle goes back to sword fighting and hand-to-hand -hand combat, today it's used primarily to describe the techniques when small teams are confronting an enemy inside a building or within a compound. Stairwells, hallways, and rooms always pose dangerous and unknown variables. From basic muzzle awareness, weapons transitions, to silent team communication, all police and military units need to be as good as they can possibly be at close quarter battle. In today's episode, we're looking at the urban police use of military style tactics and weapons in CQB. Specifically, we'll examine Los Angeles, California, which adopted the use of special units called SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics. We'll look at their use of shotguns for dynamic breaching, military-style stun grenades and launchers, and assault rifles like the H&K G36. Now we take a closer look at how an elite LA SWAT unit delivers a high-risk arrest warrant on a suspected drug manufacturing lab in a public housing area in Watts, Los Angeles. In the late 60s, Inspector Darrell Gates of the LAPD helped to develop and incorporate military-style tactics into special police units. Police officer John Nelson conceived of the idea to form a specially trained and equipped unit in the LAPD. This unit would be used to respond to high-risk situations involving hostages, shootings, and organized crime or gangs. Composed of volunteer officers, the first unit consisted of 15 teams of four men each for a total of 60 men. One of their first uses was in helping contain civil unrest in the Watts riots of LA and also to assist in a shootout with the Symbionese Liberation Army in 1974. A report issued by Los Angeles police stated that the purpose of SWAT is to provide protection, support, security, firepower, and rescue to police operations in high personal risk situations where specialized tactics are necessary to minimize casualties. One of the biggest duties of any SWAT team, and specifically LA SWAT, is combating gang violence and the illegal drug trade police became increasingly aware that gangs and drug distributors were beginning to use military-style assault rifles and fully automatic submachine guns. This meant that SWAT needed to respond by training and using similar kinds of weapons, like the M16 rifle and military-style grenades and launchers. The formation of a SWAT team in LA County really marked the development of tactical response units all across the United States. SWAT in LA really kind of took a blending of military concepts and law enforcement concepts and made them very effective for where they are. LA is a dangerous place. Something I admire about those guys is that not only do they have to get in the target and successfully take care of business there, they're surrounded by a civilian population, not all of them friendly, but definitely all of them cannot be hurt. So they're able to surgically complete a mission that's difficult at best and dangerous at worst. One of the first things any SWAT unit has to be expert in is synchronized team movement and communication. As a team moves toward a target, they use silent hand signals and arm squeezes to communicate about where and how to proceed. 
This enables the team to ensure the maximum amount of surprise, as little or no verbal communication is actually necessary. Working in cooperation with a civilian undercover police officer, the team can be maneuvered into position. When working in civilian residential areas, any police officer needs to maintain situational awareness at all times in order to minimize any possibility of civilian casualties, but this is especially true for SWAT officers when moving through an apartment building. I have great admiration for the police. Every day they protect us while putting their own lives on the line. In this violent and chaotic world, there is a need for a team that's trained to deal with situations a normal police officer isn't trained or equipped to deal with. That's a SWAT team. SWAT teams have unique training and equipment that make them not only effective warriors, but protectors of the public. Now, I am somewhere in the Czech Republic at the Urna training compound. Urna stands for Utvar Rihejo Nasazani. This is the rapid response national police force of the Czech Republic, a really elite unit. And these guys not only respond to terrorist threats, but perform a wide range of missions to include going downrange, protecting VIPs and diplomats. Obviously, to do that, they have a very high level of CQB. And a very important component of that is tactical surveillance. Can you give me a, a bit of a, a tour again, some of the systems and what this van is really for? So this car is communication car, undercover reconnaissance car, okay. and observation car. It's a smaller brother of our uh, main uh, mobile command post. Right. And uh, well, it needs to be right because you don't want people to notice it. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's more or less the same uh, equipment inside. No. Yeah. See. Yeah, we have several computers. So we can handle cameras uh, which are deployed inside the car or outside the car. We can build up a uh, communication net, and as well we can build up a uh, mobile repeater. We have like a GPS system here too. How has that worked for you in an urban environment? We use it a lot, obviously, in the woods and stuff like that. So our guys, they have a GPS in each car. Right. And uh, we have a GPS tracking system in the car, so from command post we can see deployment of the teams and of the car. Right, so, so basically what you have there is, a, a, in that vehicle, you've got two GPS systems to, to in a way, yeah, yeah, use, yeah. so one of them is used by the operators in the vehicle to know where they are yeah. and to navigate the city landscape and all that. And then the other one is for you guys to track them as a command post and know where they are. And we have two possibilities of tracking. We can track them from the ops room, from this car, and we can put computer as well in the car and we can see deployment of the car. For example, team leader can see it. That's great. So again, you've got all the levels of command are able to track this operation from yeah. the higher ups, the yeah. big guys in the command in the command center, guys in the vehicles, and then also a team, even a team leader. Have you had any problems in like a big city with the signals and being able to, to pick up the GPS uh, systems? It can happen because in the city are quite narrow streets. Yes. And it can happen that you can lose a signal. Well, I thought so because even, even when you're walking down the street too, potentially with those high buildings, and the narrow street, you, the signal can't get through. So that does happen. Not so many times because uh, GPS signal has quite good coverage in the Central Europe. Yeah, yeah. There, there is no big deal. Sometimes uh, it can happen, but uh, it's not, not, not common. Well, sitting in this van and talking to you, I think that it's safe to say if you're a criminal in the Czech Republic, you better think twice. <laughs> He's like, yeah, we're going to get you. Thanks, man. Let's take a look at the battle dress uniform and kit of an LA SWAT member. First thing we notice is the black ripstop uniform, which helps to remain unseen in the darkness, but also has a real intimidation fact. Most SWAT officers have a Kevlar helmet with additional eye and ear protection. Shooting or tactical gloves help to keep the hands free of injury and maintain a good grip on various pieces of equipment. Although underneath he's wearing a Kevlar vest, 
He's also wearing a tactical vest, which has various pockets and pouches for anything from extra magazines for his pistol or submachine gun to various types of grenades. He's also wearing what's called a drop leg holster, which sits halfway down his thigh so he can fast draw his pistol or secondary weapon. The officer's primary weapon is the HK MP5A2, fitted with a single point attachment sling. When it comes to surprising an enemy, nothing works better than a stun grenade. Otherwise known as a flashbang, Close quarter battle is a term used to describe the training of combat in buildings, hallways, and rooms. Today we're looking at the close quarter battle techniques used by Special Weapons and Tactics, or SWAT units. Their primary function was to respond to various high-risk and potentially violent scenarios, such as hostage taking, bomb threats, barricaded targets, and terrorism. SWAT began adopting the use of many different military weapons, such as automatic shotguns, assault rifles, and grenades. Military-style grenades were always designed to inflict the maximum amount of physical damage to a person or a structure. The World War II-era U.S. grenade was designed so that fragments, or shrapnel, would break away when the explosive detonates and fly in all directions. A grenade launcher uses an airburst projectile that is timed to explode according to the speed of the projectile and the distance to the target. Originally, grenades were fired from the barrel of a rifle, but in Vietnam, the M79 grenade launcher was created that allowed a single shot capacity for launched grenades. The US military developed the M203 under the barrel launcher to use with the M16 M4 assault rifle system. This enabled the soldier to carry both weapons at the same time. Under-barrel systems have a separate trigger and sight system that allow the soldiers to control when and where the projectile will go. Let's take a look at the H&K 69 single shot grenade launcher. This is obviously a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Yes, yeah, okay. this is HK 69. Okay. A grenade launcher. That can use different kinds of rounds, right? Different, yeah. Different kinds of ammunition, like like uh, gas uh, gas grenades. Uh, For you guys, it would probably be. I could see you guys using. Because that's that's a good one. In response to civil unrest, a South African weapon company created the Micor system, which uses a drum of projectiles and can fire in an automatic mode, sending more rounds downrange in a smaller amount of time. The 40 millimeter projectile is essentially a giant bullet with explosives inside. Fired by a percussion primer, there's a propelling charge at the rear of the projectile that pushes the main explosive away from the shell. Then it flies through the air and explodes on target. Hand-thrown grenades have developed over the years to become lighter and more efficient, but specifically today, we're looking at the non-lethal stun or flashbang grenade. In its modern form, the flashbang is often a reusable device that temporarily disorients the subject. The hand-thrown version is similar to any grenade. The pin is pulled, then the explosive detonates with a large sound and light flash. The flashbang is composed of a few basic parts. The explosive cartridge that fits inside the housing, the fuse or timing mechanism, and the spoon or handle release, which allows the operator to squeeze it until he's ready to throw. Once he throws it, the handle flies off, acting as a safety and the device will detonate. It can also be used remotely, where the team sets them in place and from a safe distance. Detonates them with a remote control device.
Now let's take a look at an assault rifle used by SWAT teams around the world. The H&K G36. It was originally created in 1998 for the German military as a replacement for the G3 rifle. This 5.56 by 45 millimeter gas operated assault rifle comes in various models, but all have the same basic design. With its large top carrying handle, 30 round translucent magazine and folding stock, this modern assault rifle has seen action in Kosovo, Iraq, and more recently in Libya. Let's talk about what you guys have and uh, write down a business. This, uh, this is G36 C type. A little shorter. Shorter, yeah. bit of a shorter barrel. 5.56 caliber. Like what we use in the, in the United States for the M4. Yeah. What kind of optics do you have on top of here? This is a 3G con. ACO. ACO. Uh, yep, I've optics, used those before. Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, with uh, Dr. Uh, Holosight. And what people may not know is this, 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 um, ACOG site is basically goes to four power, so the, the ACOG that we use. So this is great for long distance, but yeah. then this little red dot site can for quick target acquisition. Yeah, so you can that. transition from long distance to CQB very quickly. So it's, it's a pretty decent combo. A lot of guys roll with this uh, setup. This is just like the assault rifles we have in the United States, the M4. Yeah, same. same. Different feel, uh, different, uh, you know, where the, st where the stock weld and the cheek weld, and, and then I have to come up a little bit for that. Coming up, we go inside the head of LA SWAT in Watts as they zero in on a drug lab, utilizing all three principles of CQB, surprise, speed, and violence of action. Close quarter battle is a term used to describe the training of combat in buildings, hallways, and rooms. Today, we're looking at the creation of police special weapons and tactics units, and how they adapted military-style technologies in order to combat urban criminals and terrorist threats. One of the most important things a SWAT team absolutely has to do is get dynamic entry. Whether it's a shotgun blast, a charge, or a battering ram, it's vitally important that those guys get inside quickly and aggressively. So whether it's a military unit or some police force around the United States, surprise, speed, and violence of action principles of CQB that will win the day for them. When preparing to enter a suspected drug dealer's apartment, there are various methods of entry available to them. The three primary methods of dynamic breaching are, one, shotgun, using specialized shotgun rounds to attack either the lock or the hinges, using carefully placed and measured explosives to defeat the lock, hinges, or even cave in the door itself. And three, the swinging a battering ram to hit near the lock assembly of the door, shattering the lock and pushing the door open. We're looking through the eyes of a rapid response team member as he maneuvers with his team toward a target. For a rapid response team, maintaining situational awareness is critical for obtaining a victory and staying alive. Situational awareness involves being aware of what is happening around you to understand how information, events, and one's own actions will impact goals and objectives, both immediate and in the near future. Inadequate situational awareness has been identified as one of the primary factors in accidents attributed to human failure. This LA SWAT unit is using all three principles of CQB to complete their arrest warrant at this drug lab. 
They're using speed by approaching the target area and covering all angles and signaling silently. They're using surprise by approaching quietly and utilizing flashbang grenades that stun and surprise the target. Then they're using violence of action by aggressively entering the objective premises and subduing opponents that are unarmed and eliminating targets that are a threat. The Benelli M4 shotgun is an Italian dual-action assault shotgun. It fires a 12-gauge round and has both pump action and automatic reload modes. Rapid response and SWAT teams use shotguns primarily for dynamic entry, but they're also sometimes used to subdue a target. As ammunition technology has developed over the years, police and military generally use three types of shotgun ammo. The first type of round that is the most efficient for destroying the door hinges in dynamic entry is the slug, which is effectively just a large heavy piece of metal with an explosive to push it out of the barrel. The second type is the more traditional buckshot, which are several round small bearings that spread from the end of the barrel as it's fired. The final and most lethal type of round is the razor round. This ammo is designed to do the maximum amount of damage. Essentially, it shoots many long, super sharp razors that rip through the target. All three of these rounds are used in different SWAT CQB missions. Shotguns. Very iconic weapon. You see them in movies, TV. You hear that noise, you know bad stuff is about to happen. They're actually a really good weapon. They're very versatile. There's a lot you can do with them. You can use shotguns to breach a door, i.e. to get through it. And you do that by attacking the locking mechanism. Some guys attack the hinges. It's kind of up to you. I think shotguns are useful in my world to basically stop people from coming after you. They're also good in close uh, environments like the jungle or woods because it sprays. Shotguns are good. They're simple. They're really easy to use. I will say this though, if you've never shot one of them before, you better be ready for the kick because it will really go. But how do you combat that? You just get a nice firm stance, pull it tight in your shoulder. When you shoot it, you'll be fine. Really good weapon to have. We call these are really one of the best home defense weapons you can have. When we come back, we take a final look at our SWAT team's assault on an illegal drug laboratory to better understand all the planning and training that go into this kind of dangerous operation. Today we're looking at police special weapons and tactics teams. Now let's further dissect this CQB scenario to better understand how an LA SWAT team approaches and executes a high-risk search and arrest warrant. The team takes up position in a van close enough to have line of sight on the target building. The four-man team moves through sidewalks and along adjacent buildings in a basic single file cover formation. Once within sight of the building entry point, the team stops and awaits a signal from their undercover officer already in place. When given the green light, they advance toward the entry point, carefully observing the windows of the building and the surrounding area for potential threats. Moving from outside to inside a target area is a particularly vulnerable time for an assault team and needs to happen quickly but carefully. Once inside the building, the target apartment is located and the door is breached. They have to work quickly in this chaotic situation to contain any possible violent threats and minimize civilian and team casualties. The war on drugs was most focused in and around the area of Oakland, California and Los Angeles in the 1970s and 80s as two warring factions of gangs tried to control the sales and profit of drugs coming in and out of the US. A team must maneuver through the chaos of a firefight in order to understand the threats that they can subdue using non-lethal means and the threats that may need to be eliminated using extreme force. When a target is cornered and armed, the use of a flashbang or stun grenade helps to temporarily disorient in order for the team to move into an aggressive firing position and potentially take the kill shot. In today's episode, we learned about the creation of police rapid response teams, specifically in Los Angeles, California. 
We saw how the use of military-style weapons, such as assault rifles and stun grenades, help police to overwhelm targets and control the outcome of an urban CQB scenario. Finally, we learned how the application of all these techniques and tactics help to keep civilians and police alive and maintain all three principles of CQB, surprise, speed, and violence of action.